Hi there, and welcome to The D-Spot, a brand new vodcast podcast series that's boldly redefining dyslexia. We're bringing together inspirational educators, industry disruptors, passionate change makers, many made by dyslexia. We're going to reveal all there is to know about dyslexic thinking and why the world needs more of it right now. Inspiring, informative, surprising conversations set on creating change. This episode is called Dyslexic Superpowers. And today we're joined by three education leaders who come from very different settings, but are all passionate about the value of dyslexic thinking and the importance of recognizing and supporting dyslexic strengths. We have Leveja Bullard from Thomasville Heights in Atlanta, Josh Clark from the Skank School in Atlanta, who's also chair-elect of the IDA, and Sarah Lennon, who is from Millfield School. So just a little bit on Made by Dyslexia before we dive into the conversation. Um, our mission as a charity is to redefine dyslexia, to help the world to see dyslexia as a strength and a super valuable way of thinking. We've done a lot of research in the workplace uh, that looks at the fact that dyslexic thinking is vital for the future. And now we want to help every single educator to understand that and learn how to spot, support and empower dyslexic learners. We've created a campaign called Connect the Spots, which has a mission to train every single teacher in the world by 2025. And now I'd just like to dive into this conversation with our wonderful guest today to talk about dyslexic superpowers, how to spot them in our kids and why it is so absolutely vital. So if I can start with um, you, Laveja. Um, you are working in an amazing school in Atlanta. Um, I'd be very privileged to visit the school. I know you work very closely with Josh and his team at Skank School and Dyslexia Resource. And I believe you're also dyslexic yourself. Um, can you tell us why is dyslexia so important to you? And why do you think it's so important to actually spot and support it in your students? Thank you. Um, dyslexia has been an integral part of my life. Um, what I have noticed and what I've been extremely thankful for with the partnership that um, we've had at our school is that we've been able to gain more insight um, as educators um, and more insight on the research behind dyslexia. And as, as an individual who is dyslexic, I did not know it was so prevalent. Um, and so knowledge to me, knowledge is power. And it's just really changed the way that I have helped support teachers, help support students, and just look at the bigger picture. And um, the more that we encourage each other to learn more about how to support dyslexics, the better it will be for the world. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree. And Josh, how about you? I know the, the Skank School um, is one of the first schools in the US that supported dyslexia and we've worked very closely with you in our teacher training as we have with Sarah and, and the team at Millfield. But tell us what's, why is dyslexia so important to you personally and, and in the students that you support? So certainly. So, um, you know, I think much like LaVasia and so many of us that are participating today, Though I didn't realize it at the time, growing up, dyslexia was a huge influence on me, uh, both in terms of, of uh, struggles that I had in school. Um, uh, I did not have the, the great fortune of, of having uh, kind of identification and support available. So I often, in the initial uh, part of my schooling, has really experienced this, this kind of question of why I was having such a hard time, why is this so difficult, and really became disillusioned by school. At the same time, and somewhat attributed to, to that very same factor, I also found that I had no choice but to invest in the strengths that I had, because that's what allowed me to navigate and, and uh, find my way through. And so I had this, this double-edged coin of, of, of a struggle that I had to, to try to understand, had to figure out, had to work through. And at the same time, it, I also uh, really began to hone in and understand and become very self-aware about my own strengths, because that's what I knew was my path to success. And so as I, I sit here today as a school leader, um, as a parent of two dyslexics, all I can think about of what would be the power if, if I could give a child who has those strengths, if I could help not eliminate, but possibly mitigate some of those challenges 
uh, make that path a little bit smoother and allow them to, to, to really have that same opportunity to double down on their strengths, but not at the cost of some of the struggle Imagine what they could do uh, as an individual, but also what they can contribute to the larger world uh, moving forward. And so that's that's what really excites me and makes me passionate about this work. And Sarah Millfield, as you know, Millfield turned my life around when I was about nine years old from feeling that I was just a complete failure to, to then actually really recognizing my strength. So I know Millfield's really been doing that since the 1930s. I was there a bit after that. I'm not quite that <laughs> old, but um, for you, uh, I know you've worked across lots of different settings, but always really focused on the strengths that these kids have. Yeah, absolutely. For me, the, the strength is everything to do with dyslexia. So um, as you said, I'm dyslexic myself. My original schooling, everything about my dyslexia was a strength. I didn't know I was dyslexic, but it was a very creative, very, um, very forward thinking school where everything was about uh, creative writing and it wasn't about the punctuation or the grammar. It was about the thoughts and the ideas that you got down on paper. So I absolutely excelled in that school and then I changed schools. And suddenly I went from sort of winning all the awards in English to being in bottom set and thinking, gosh, why have I suddenly failed? What's suddenly gone wrong for me? And it was just the shift in focus to the skills and the punctuation, the spelling, rather than the creativity and the writing. And I think, what is it we're looking for as a society? Are we wanting to have brilliant spellers? Are we wanting to have dynamic, creative thinkers? And when you focus on the strength of dyslexia, that would be a dynamic, creative thinker, and remove the barriers of spelling by using um, <clears throat> technology. In my case, it was my dad checking everything that I ever did, <laughs> all my work before I ever handed it in. And you remove those barriers and you explore the strengths. You, you, you really open up the world for the child and, and actually you make the world a better place because when you look at all the entrepreneurs in the world, when you look at people who are driving society, when you look at the successes, that is driven by dyslexics. So as soon as you open up a world of strengths, you're actually opening up not only the world to these children, but the world itself, I, I believe. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's more and more research coming out now, and we have some more research coming out later this year that is looking about the importance of strengths in the workplace. Um, we, we've worked on a book, um, which we've just released called Extraordinary People. Um, and the book has actually, uh, we, we've categorized seven different archetypes that are dyslexic strengths in children. Um, and they're, they're strengths that actually lead into the, the superpowers that we know that these dyslexic people can take into life and are gonna be so um, important for the workforce of the future. Um, what would you say, I know a lot of parents uh, and a lot of teachers um, a, don't know how to spot those strengths, but also um, don't really know how to nurture them in our kids. So what would you say, um, if Josh, if I can start with you, in order to, to actually spot and support dyslexic strengths, how do you think we can do that better? I mean, obviously, we're hoping this book's going to help. But as, as teachers and parents, what do you think people can, can do? Sure, and, and, and in fact, I had a conversation this morning with a parent who newly diagnosed, uh, uh, I think second grade child, and I actually mentioned the book. I, I actually referenced it just this morning because this parent, wonderful intentions, trying to do everything right for their child and was terrified of saying out loud to this, uh, to their, 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 their son or their daughter, hey, you're dyslexic, right? So I think one of the pieces that we need to recognize is that it's not only is it okay to talk about this, it's necessary to talk about this. We're talking about brilliant kids who as young as kindergarten, first, second grade, they are very aware that something's going on. They're aware that Sally is having an easier time with this than they are, but they don't have a narrative as to why. They don't have an explanation. And if we, if we ignore it or if with good intentions, we try to shy away from the conversation, ultimately what we do is we put kids in a situation where they have to come up with the reasoning themselves and chances are they're not gonna think about strengths. They're not gonna think about opportunities. Instead, they're gonna start this kind of a dark spiral of thinking that, well, there must be something wrong with me. I must not be capable, which then spirals out beyond just reading and writing and, and, and other academic tasks and really affects their whole psyche. So I think number one is we have to talk about it. And then we need to talk about the whole picture, not just what we have a hard time with, but also what are the things that we are good at? What are the things that we can excel? And help students understand that sometimes schools 
may not be the place where they always get to do the things that they're so good at and the things that where they excel, but that's what life's actually about. And so we need to help them get the support they need in school, hopefully be in a situation where we're, we have a school that understands and is in putting things in place so that those strengths come about and get to be articulated and grown. But also, again, I think, I think the conversation is so important. And finally, I think we have to ensure that every teacher on this planet takes the training that Made by Dyslexia did, goes out and educates themselves so that we can understand when we're working with a child who's struggling, why might that be? What are the signs that we need to look for? Again, so we can then start this cycle of first empowering them by talking about it and then bringing the resources as necessary to give them the, the, the support that they need to, to, to be successful. Thank you, Josh. And Levasia, I think um, at Thomasville Heights, you have some, some very kids from very poor families who, who have a lot of other issues that will be holding their learning back. But I know you've said to us in the past that you've actually used our training to talk to parents to actually get them to, to focus on the D word and dyslexia. Is that, how, how do you think that plays out in a school that doesn't have as perhaps affluent um, parents as you would get at the Skank School? Um, my, my belief as an educator, because I'm not yet a parent, is that no matter what class you come from, no matter where you are, parents want better for their children. And so what the Dyslex Made by Dyslexia training has allowed me to do is it has afforded me the opportunity to give parents a website to get them the, the information that they might, that in most cases they can't afford to find. So for me, the training has been, um, very important as far as giving parents the step-by-step, -step, the language, um, the, the strategies that they could then use at home, but also communicate with the teachers. And so we've done two approaches where we've definitely focused on um, improving teacher training and the quality of instruction that we're providing specifically to support students who struggle with reading. Um, some have been identified as dyslexic and some have not. Um, so that's definitely been a strength that we've seen um, shift as far as shift supporting teachers. But as far as parents, we've definitely seen that giving them language, giving them questions to ask. And um, from what I've seen from the book, which I'm excited to also share with parents is it's giving them a different lens to look at. Um, as far as our society and as far as education, I've definitely seen a shift in the past um, decade or a little bit more. Um, where we're not so much looking at the rote memorization and fact finding that we've had in the past. Um, and when we think about 21st century skills, we have to prepare our students to um, flourish in their creativity and flourish with their imaginations. But we also have to have a shift as adults as what we're looking at to say, um, is my child successful? And so by having this language and having um, giving more support to parents and the teachers, they've been able to make a small shift to open and expand their, their idea of what a successful student looks like. That's, that's fantastic. And I, I think the language around dyslexia is changing. I, I think we've seen it change in the time that we've been operating. Um, and I know, of course, Millfield has always had that positive language around it. Just in terms of, um, how we actually get all parents to focus on strengths and all teachers to focus on strengths. If you think about the, the research around the, the ratio of one in five, um, which says that for, for every um, five uh, or for every one negative thing, you have to have five positive things to counteract it. For a dyslexic child, it's really tough in school because we are focusing an awful lot around what dyslexic children can't do, not what they can do. How do you think we can actually shift that, Sarah? I know in the UK, we do have an education system, sadly, at the moment, and we're pushing really hard to change it, as are most teachers. We have got a system that is focusing on rote learning and putting a lot of importance into the wrong things. But what do you think we can do to, to sort of push that issue forward for our kids right now? So I think that the most important thing is to take it out of the child. I think self-esteem is so huge when it comes to dyslexia and often the the parents as parents as educators we want everything to be perfect for our child we want everything to be happy we want everything to be nice we want everything to be you know we want our children to be making progress and the children I think often 
because they feel like they're getting it wrong in the classroom, feel like there's something wrong with them. So the first thing I do is I identify what's going wrong, what isn't working for you, and how can I take that away from you? How can that be about something else? I can't spell. Okay, so, well, that's okay, because computers can spell for us. We can, um, you know, we can ask Alexa, we can ask Siri, we can go into Google, we can get Microsoft Editor, you know, that's okay, we can we can do that. Okay, um, I, I stare out of the window a lot, I'm, di I'm daydreaming a lot, and my teacher tells me off, if, if, uh, you know, if, for example, well, what are you thinking about when you're looking out of the window? Well, I'm thinking about all those things that my teacher's told me, and I'm linking them to all the other lessons. Have you let your teacher know that? No. Okay, so as soon as you let your teacher know that, they're going to be absolutely adoring you and loving the things that you're bringing into the classroom because that big picture thinking is actually a strength. So looking out of the, the window isn't something you should feel bad about. It's because you're thinking and processing all of that information. And we break down everything, one thing at a time and take it out of the child. So instead of it being a problem, a problem that the child feels is about them, it's actually normally linked to one of their strengths and one of their brilliances. Um, at, at Millfield, we have a brilliance curriculum. Our curriculum is defined by brilliance. So all the time we're thinking with children, how are you brilliant? What can we do to make you more brilliant? And all the time just focusing on those strengths and taking the barriers away from the child. We talk about enabling environments all the time. We don't so much talk about differentiation because we want to have high expectations for all of our children. So we make the learning accessible for every child so they can celebrate their strengths. And we remove those barriers from being a negative thing about the child and turn them into a positive about how they learn. We focus a lot on metacognition. How do we learn best? And how can we ensure as educators, we're making sure that the children can use all of those strategies in the classroom for how they learn best. Yeah, that brings me on to one of my pet points, which is the yin and yang of dyslexia, because I actually think that um, certainly with my kids, I could see their dyslexia through their strengths, but for a class teacher, they may not have seen that. So, so I think if you're an imaginer and you've got this incredible creative imagination, you're probably going to sit in a classroom and daydream because you'll be thinking about all the amazing things that are happening outside. So if, if teachers can, can, can look at a child and see that child's daydreaming maybe they might be dyslexic this could be imagination that we're all problem solving that we're seeing here or you have one of the other archetypes we have in the book is people people um, who are always you know wanting to make sure everybody else is okay and they're probably chatterboxes and and sort <laughs> of fiddling or you know being messing around with um chatting and all of those things or Questioners, um, for example, I know I used to drive my grandmother absolutely potty because whenever she told me something, I said, no, but you sure that's right? Couldn't we do it that way? Which for, for teachers must be really difficult. Do you think, Josh, that you can actually spot a dyslexic through um, that sort of yin and yang in the classroom for teachers who don't really know too much about dyslexia? Do you think that's something that we could be doing? Oh, without question, right? So we know all students, really regardless of background, regardless of dyslexic or not, everybody wants to do well, right? And so when I, when I meet teachers or we run into situations and we say, well, he's just not trying, he's nine, right? There's no, there's no nine-year-old out there that uh, has independently said, I, I don't want to do this, or I don't want to learn to read, or I don't want to, to, to improve, right? And so I always encourage teachers to, to think about that, that child that's struggling, look for, the, look for the unexpected, as you say, that yin and yang, that same child who you might, uh, 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 during science class, ask you a thousand questions and be able to articulate all these ideas, and then he turns in his homework and it looks like he didn't put in any effort or he didn't try very hard. There's a reason for that, right? There's a reason. What is that discrepancy? What, when, when, when kids puzzle us, when we think, huh, why are they not responding uh, the way that we want? I think one of the shifts that we have to make, which is hard, is we have to stop saying, well, what is that child not doing that I'm asking? Or what, are they, what, what goal are they not reaching that I've set for them? Instead, we have to think about what am I not giving them? What mm -hmm. is it, I love Sarah's point about what can I take away 
in order to help figure out what's going on and what they're, they're capable of. So while to come to an actual diagnosis, right? We do need a level of expertise. We do need folks um, with, with a background that can help us get there. But as teachers in the field, all we really need to know is, is, is know our students. We just need to get to know them. What makes them tick? Where do they excel and where do they struggle? And that's really the beginning of understanding, okay, there's more to this picture and what do I need to do to get this child to the next step? And, and do you see uh, that a lot with your kids at Thomasville? Um, what, what I see is the, the need to, um, for lack of a better word, uh, highlight or implant the positive. A lot of our students, um, when I think about research or different things that I've learned over the years, the Matthew effect stands um, and, and is really strong to me. And it's kind of shifted a lot of my thinking before growth mindset. And it's the idea that if you are not successful at something, then it just creates a negative spiral. And it is very difficult for you to ever get out of that. And it actually magnifies and gets worse and worse. And so for a lot of our students who struggle with reading and who are identified as dyslexic, um, schooling, reading, it becomes very negative until you can reverse it. But the good news is if you can start with strengths or if you can highlight and give a student, a child, an adult, anyone, something that they're positive and something that they're good at, then you can reverse it and then they can practice and they, there's a positive experience from doing something that you are successful at. And so what I've noticed um, is a lot of our students um, just don't know what they're good at um, because like it's been stated before, their minds focus on the negative. They focus on, I can't do this and I haven't been able to do it. And so small shifts that we've been able to do is um, change the language. So you can't do it yet. And so, you know, I'm not able to do this yet, or I haven't been able to figure this out, but I have figured out this piece. And so I definitely believe what we focused on is just finding the proper language to support um, our students as they are growing and starting to witness the successes. The other thing we notice is sometimes they have successes, but they're so used to not um, feeling and seeing them, they skip right over them. And we're like, no, this was amazing. You were able to do this. And so, um, it does require you know, the adults in the room to also focus on celebration and highlighting um, the smallest wins because they snowball into larger wins. Yeah, absolutely. And, and how do you think you spot dyslexic strengths? Uh, I mean, I would, I would suggest, certainly with my kids and, and with me, it's finding something that you love to do and are passionate about because you naturally want to do that more and more. And the more you do things, the better you become at them. So that sort of passion for something, doing more and more of it becomes your superpower. And it can be something really simple, like you know, being very good with people or being very thoughtful and having a lot of empathy and wanting to help people. It doesn't have to be you know, a champion skateboarder or basketball player or, or musician. Um, Sarah, how, would you agree that that's how you spot a child's strengths? Absolutely. I mean, we're in a very, very fortunate position in Millfield in that we have incredibly talented pupils and staff who recognise those talents. Um, but like like we said before, it it's the children. And, and I love that point that you made that sometimes children are so used to not succeeding they skip over their successes and they're so used to not getting things right they miss this this picture of the things that they're brilliant at so all the time I'm going back to what is it you do well where do you feel most happy if I could say to you you're just going to spend the perfect day how would that day be what would it look like what would you be doing and often they tell you all the things that as a specialist we know are related to their dyslexia and we're, we're lucky to have that knowledge and and I think that's why it's important that everyone understands dyslexia and, and, and takes this training but they talk about you know oh well, all, uh, all I want to do all day is play Lego I'd love to just play Lego all day I love creating and I don't I'm, I'm terrible at following the instructions but I make a pirate ship that looks brilliant by the end of the day like you said when you do the things that you enjoy you do them more and more they become your superpower they, they often become your job you know uh, uh, people people who love people are going into those care roles or those teaching roles and I think that the more we celebrate and empower children into thinking what they do well and recognizing that the better it is 
Yeah, absolutely. And I and I think it, you know, it's not it's not where you teach, it's what you teach. I think that yeah. every parent can actually look out for those strengths. And if you do have a child that is absolutely mad about Lego or Legos, as you call it in America, um, then, you know, nurture that. Make that, that could be your, your next architect in the making. And that's so important to actually celebrate all of those things. So as, as you guys are all dyslexic, I'm going to put you on the spot now and ask you what your superpowers are. So Josh, I'm going to kick off with you. I know what I think they are, everybody, but I'm going to ask you. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, well, so I, I, you know, now I'm, you know, almost 40 years old, had the privilege of, of kind of finding my space in the professional world and, and all those things. And I would now tell you that I feel like one of the things that I'm, I'm, I, I'm good at is the big picture and making these connections, right, uh, uh, across otherwise kind of disparate subjects or ideas. That's something that I feel good about. But like uh, LaVeja said, I never knew I was good at that. I just thought anybody could do that. And all I, you know, growing up, I was just bad at stuff. So it really wasn't until later on that I realized, huh, there's not, not everybody has that, that same interest or that same capability. So I, I, I feel privileged to even know it um, uh, uh, as, I, as I, you know, carry on with my career. And LaVeja, what about you? Um, I, I, I have quite a few um, that I pull from over the... Um, over the years, um, but I would say um, questioning um, has definitely been a strength of mine because it um, it helps me understand. And when I can get the answers that some people don't really understand why I'm asking the question and I've learned to preface myself to say, I'm not asking this um, to uh, have a right or wrong. I just want to know, do we have the, the answer to this. Um, and when we don't have the answer, um, my ability to see the bigger picture also comes through to say, did we consider this? Um, and so I think that also plays into the people, the people person. Um, I, I really pull from lots of areas and think about people and think about um, how they feel in si different situations, how this would impact them in another situation. Um, and so I also think that that has definitely been um, a superpower of mine that has helped me in education for sure. Um, but just in relationships and getting along with everyone overall, um, just to think about how um, people are impacted by our decisions and our choices. And Sarah, what about yours? Um, I think for me, I think I, I go off in so many different directions. I think it's, and I think really it's that, that probably that bigger picture. I'm, I'm constantly in a hundred different directions at the same time, pulling everything in all of those different directions together. And in my head, creating this incredible picture and linking it all. And for me, the important part of that is using that for people. Um, it's caring for people, caring for, um, caring for children, caring for my friends, caring for my colleagues, and just having this, huge amount of empathy for everyone around me and wanting to make a difference with them and so I think it's probably the the bigger picture thinking and and the people people that are, are, are my strengths really. <clears throat> and do you guys all think that that was there when you were kids? It was something that you could spot when you were kids? Yeah I, 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 it was a survival tactic for me I don't know if I spotted it but because uh, that's I would say the other kind of superpower is I learned how to just talk and just, you know, avoid whatever it is that the answer that you want that I can't come up with, I'll find a way to make you feel satisfied to kind of deflect. Um, so it was there, but yeah, as a kid, I, 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 didn't, I didn't characterize it as a strength because I, I didn't know to. And did, did, you, did you have those strengths naturally as a child of Asia? Uh, yes, I did. Um, I have report cards from the past to uh, to uh, highlight that um, I have been very talkative um, my entire life, um, and the teachers made it a point to um, put I am a social butterfly um, on all of my report cards. Uh, my mom, uh, I guess she thought it was because I was an only child, and when I got to school, um, I could be around, um, you know, my peers. And so that's why I would talk more. Um, but I actually was not diagnosed until after 30. Um, and so I just figured out how to cope um, when I didn't know the answer. Um, and it was through asking questions, whether it was to my peers or to my teacher, um, and then being able to um, put it all together 
again, big picture. So I definitely think, and the puzzle, <laughs> I'm actually really good at solving puzzles. And so I feel like school in some way was one giant puzzle. Like, okay, the teacher wants me to write a story. I am very creative. How do I get this going? I will spend the majority of my time, I'll write the story quickly, but I'll spend the majority of my time drawing pictures. And then my book was highlighted in school for having outstanding illustrations. And I had some, you know, some words in there, but um, definitely something that I've just learned to um, cope with. So I'm, I'm very excited, like I said, to have this language and these aha moments um, of what in my schooling made me successful um, at one area. And then as I went to a different school, how it also became a struggle because the instruction wasn't the same and the teachers weren't um, so open to questions and problem solving and things like that. And how about you, Sarah? Did you always have that empathy and people people and big picture when you were at school? Yeah, I've, I've always been this type of person. I was always the one who was friends with everybody and, you know, oh, let's ask Sarah and she, she might be able to sort it out. And <laughs> so I've always had that. That's always been me, but I didn't realize that that was my strength until um, I think it, like we've sort of um, said before, until I found this incredible career that I find myself in where I could use everything about me that I loved as a child to just carry on being me um, and use it, you know, to sort of as, as my career. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've always been this way. I just didn't realize that that was, that was something that could, could be brilliant in my future. So how amazing it will be if we can, or if you guys can all be untapping that in all of your kids every day, which I'm sure you are. And if we can kind of help the world to do that too. Um, so one final thought, because I know we're, we're close to the end of our time. Um, at Made by Dyslexia, our absolute mission is to redefine dyslexia. So to help the world to see dyslexia as a strength first. And that's something we're really, really passionate to do. If there was one thing that you would like the world to know about dyslexia or one thing that you can change, could change, what would that be? Josh, should we kick off with you? Sure, great question. I, I think the one thing, oh, there's many things, but the one thing I would say is I, for teachers and for parents, but especially for teachers, I want them to know that the tools are available, the, the resources are there and you can do this. Um, I just think the more that we can empower teachers to be in the driver's seat and to, to feel the confidence and have the tools they need to help these kids, I think sometimes we, we unnecessarily mystify all of this and overwhelm our teachers and therefore we don't act. And I think it, it can be complex, but it's also doable and we can do it. Awesome. Sarah? Gosh, yeah, I was, I, I was, that's exactly what I'm thinking. I think, I think it's, it's really important. I think um, people just need to understand dyslexia and what it is. And I, that's what I love about Made by Dyslexia. It's just saying, this is what it is. This is what it is in the workplace. This is what it is in your child. And, and all of this is just a strength. And I think for me, I think dyslexia is about recognizing who you are absolutely loving it and going you know using all of those strengths that you naturally have as a dyslexic <clears throat> in the world and not being frightened of it not being frightened of dyslexia using it as your superpower because um it really is brilliant yeah 100 percent. and last up Lavasia, you started so you can finish <laughs> just say that i would want people to know that um the 21st century skills, the 21st century, we're, we're here. It's an amazing time to be alive. And I mean, we have drivable cars that drive themselves. We've made it to Mars. Um, there's lots of amazing things um, happening, um, but they didn't happen from a cookie cutter perspective. They've happened from somebody imagining, somebody questioning how we do things, um, and somebody deciding to move and make make things happen. And we are fortunate enough to have dyslexics who this is their these these qualities are their strengths. And so um, we just need to encourage it and um, remember that the sky is no longer the limit. You know, the universe is the limit. And so I look forward to um, continuing to. Um, push our our kids and our adults so that um, we can continue to see um, all the outstanding things that will happen um, by flourishing 
these uh, specific qualities and characteristics. Fantastic. Thank you so much, guys. It was really, really insp inspiring chat. Thank you so much for joining us.